Welcome back, America. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is always welcome on the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good morning, Governor. Welcome back. Great to be back, Hugh. Thanks for having me. I want to play for you a brief excerpt from an uh, interview former President Trump did with Sean Hannity two nights ago that did not get much attention, but I heard it, and I want your reaction to it. Here it is. But ultimately, he's going to take over all of Ukraine. That's uh, He was talking about Putin, and let's play it again so everyone understands. The president was asked about Putin and Ukraine, and he said this. But ultimately, he's going to take over all of Ukraine. What do you think of that, Chris Christie? I think it's it's awful, uh, but I think it's exactly what you can expect from someone who, you know, has shown um, a liking for authoritarianism, um, from someone who has said before that he admires Putin. Um, and I, I just think it's uh, also a defeatism uh, that, uh, you know, we should permit this type of uh, aggression to occur in this world, and that it doesn't have other ramifications. The follow-up question should have been, well, if that's the case, then what is President Xi going to think about American intentions to help Taiwan defend itself? What will the Iranians think about America's intentions to help Israel protect itself? What will the North Koreans think about America's intentions to help South Korea defend itself? Uh, that's the signal sending that's happening here, and, and it's a lack of recognition that this is also a proxy war by China um, by supporting Russia economically and, and militarily in this aggression against Ukraine to try to show our allies around the world that we're not a reliable ally any longer. What does Chris Christie think about American policy in aiding Ukraine? Look, I think we should have done more earlier. We should have done more, certainly, during the Obama administration. That was an absolute disgrace that Barack, Barack Obama would not send any lethal aid to the Ukrainians to help defend themselves all the way back then. Um, and that the Trump administration was better on it, but still not as aggressive as they should have been. And certainly the Biden administration not only didn't deter Putin, but they sent a signal to Putin early on that aggression would be OK when President Biden said, well, a small incursion probably wouldn't be a problem. You know, people listen to what the American president says and does, and they act accordingly. And that's why we need a president who will be very deliberate and smart about what comes out of their mouth. And the, you know, the clip you just played from Donald Trump with Sean Hannity doesn't fit either of those criteria. Do, um, do you think there is a split in the Republican Party over aid to Ukraine? I think there is an argument in the party about it, absolutely. And I think you just need to listen to people like Donald Trump or like Governor DeSantis. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly what side he's on at this point, but, you know, there's, you know, there's certainly mixed signals being sent. And when that happens, you empower uh, authoritarian aggressors. All right, I'm going to come back to politics in a moment, Governor, uh, and particularly President, former President Trump's speech in Waco. But a quick question about guns. You dealt with guns and gun violence. This is the aftermath of a horrific shooting. The manifesto has not been released. Is there any legitimate law enforcement reason still for the manifesto not to have been released? Not that I can think of, especially given the fact that the, uh, the perpetrator is, is dead. Um, the only possible explanation is if there's some conspiracy. If for some reason this person did not act alone. There's no indication in what we know publicly yet about that. Um, but that's the only potential excuse, although I don't see anything in what we've read already that would indicate that's the case. Uh, if, it, if it lingers and it's not disclosed today or tomorrow, what do you think is the explanation for that? Well, I would think that there are folks who don't like um, whatever is said in that manifesto doesn't fit their particular point of view. Um, and they're trying to keep it quiet because it doesn't fit, you know, the, the mainstream media's um, explanation for these type of events. All right. The next question has to do with the Silicon Valley Bank, which I believe is growing as an issue. I think it was a bailout of protected people. I think it was an absolute gift to Silicon Valley elites. What do you think about it? Yeah, look, I, I think I think moral hazard is real, Hugh. Um, I think that when folks uh, put more than the FDIC limit in, in a particular bank, they need to know that that money is at risk. 
Um, and, and not only do the depositors need to know that, but so do the managers of the bank. And I think that so, the Silicon Valley Bank bailout, um, you know, was not right, shouldn't have been done. Um, and it's just another mistake by the Biden administration's Fed uh, and that administration with Janet Yellen at Treasury um, that helps the people who help them. Now, there was a notable shift in Fox polling on the presidential race. And as of yesterday, in polling taken between March 24th and March 27th, Donald Trump, among Republicans, leads with 54 percent. Ron DeSantis, a distant second with 24 percent. Then you fall off to Mike Pence with six and everybody else. A, how much credibility do you put into that? And B, is the former president benefiting from, uh, uh, again, the renewal of resentment against elites drove this election in 2016. I think it's coming back. What do you think about both of those questions, the poll and the renewal? Well, look, on the poll, you know, you can, I, I think poll these days, as you know, becomes more and more difficult and less and less reliable because of the way polls are conducted. Um, and so I, I don't, and in terms of the impact of that on the race itself, I don't give it a whole lot of credence. But let's assume for the sake of your question, Hugh, that the poll is accurate. I think there's two things that Donald Trump are benefiting from right now. One is the one you mentioned, which is, you know, backlash from the Silicon Valley Bank issue. But I think, you know, the second one is backlash to the actions of the Manhattan VA. Um, I, I think the anticipation of a uh, of an indictment in Manhattan where crime is running rampant, violent crime is running rampant, and it's people's idea that somehow, how do you, how does that help the quality of life now, of the people in New York to be chasing a seven-year-old payment uh, to a porn star? I, I agree with that. Now, I want to go to a, a submarine issue. It's everywhere discussed and not frequently debated, and that is, what do we do about children who identify as the opposite gender? There's a headline in the New York Times today. GOP lawmakers override Kentucky governor's veto on anti-trans laws. First of all, they're not anti-trans laws. They're the legislature's view of what is appropriate medical treatment, but they are being portrayed as that. How do you deal with this issue when you were asked about it in appearances such as you made in New Hampshire over the weekend? Well, I wasn't asked about it, but what I will say to you is that I don't think it is the government's business, first and foremost, to be getting in between parents and their children on how to discuss sexuality. And so trans is just one of those issues, Hugh. But the first thing is that I think there is growing resentment in this country that the education establishment believes that it is not only better, but is entitled to be getting in between parents and their children on the teaching and the morality of what we, we show our children regarding sexuality. And I think, look, I've seen this issue up close to you. I, I, I've had folks in, in, in my orbit who have dealt with this issue. Um, and, and I don't think there's, there are parents who wouldn't be enormously concerned about a child who feels this way and wanting to help that child in whatever way they felt was appropriate. And my view is the parents should be making these decisions, not bureaucrats in the school system. And I do believe there is a legitimate argument that the medical community is running away from controversy by encouraging these, uh, especially irreversible surgeries. And I think puberty blockers are increasingly obviously in Britain dangerous. Is this something you expect to be an issue in the 2024 campaign? Look, I think the overall issue will be. And, and how you answer it um, and is going to say a lot about how you feel about parental rights um, and how you feel about how aggressive government is allowed to be in people's personal lives. I think it's a liberty issue. Now, that liberty issue, of course, raises a lot. Do people have the right to do things that demonstrably might injure children down the road? Or can we just wait? We'll come back to that. I want to go back to Donald Trump. How did you assess his Waco speech? Um, I thought it was a snoozer. Um, I think the act is getting very old. And I think that no leader who is backward looking um, is a leader who can be uh, victorious. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about his grievances. 
And I said this in New Hampshire on Monday, you know, when he says, I am your retribution. And no, thank you. No, thank you. You know, the only retribution he will be is his own retribution. He cares about himself first and foremost and exclusively. And that speech in Waco proves exactly that. You've been his friend a long time. Are you still his friend? I don't, I don't think we're friends any longer, no. I haven't right. spoken to him, Hugh, since December of 2020. All right. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, January 6th meme, which is developing that there are political prisoners in the United States. I do not believe that. I do not believe there is a single political prisoner in the United States. Sometimes you draw a tough prosecutor. Sometimes you draw an easy prosecutor. But we do not do political prosecutions. What do you think? Anyone who is involved in the January 6th um, riot on Capitol Hill um, needs to have their particular conduct evaluated by law enforcement. And if charges are brought, are entitled to a jury of their peers to make that evaluation. And that's exactly what happens in this country. It's what is happening. And the idea that somehow this is a, a political action is, is just, to me, um, wrong. Now, as you said, I've been a prosecutor for seven years at the highest levels, and prosecutors have to make good, responsible judgments, and we need to evaluate them on those judgments. But the idea somehow that this is a group of people who, should, who are praiseworthy, who, who were participating in the violence, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Is there a current in the present Republican Party that is attempting to legitimize anything to do with the January 6th riot, which I would reject? And I just want to hear what you think about that. Well, I think Donald Trump's trying to do that. And, and, I, and I think that the more oxygen he's given on this issue, um, the more he tries to mainstream his particular point of view. But what I want your listeners to understand is that's not motivated by his concern for those people. It is motivated by his concern for himself and wanting to minimize what his lack of action on January 6th helped to contribute to. And now, it's all selfish, Hugh. It is not in any way meant to try to help anyone but himself. And, and it's this party of me versus party of us I've been talking about. We need to either get back to being a party of us, where we work for all the American people, and not have every policy decision, every political endorsement, run through just one prism only, which is, is it good for Donald Trump or not? Because that's the way he's making these judgments, and it is awful for our party and worse for our country. I want to close by the conversation you had with voters in New Hampshire in which you intimated you would be his nemesis on a debate stage. That indicates that you're thinking about getting onto the debate stage. What do you, what did you unpack that for us? What do you mean you would do to Donald Trump what you did to Marco Rubio? Well, what I said to you in New Hampshire was that we need to have someone on the stage who is going to challenge the president frontally, directly. What I'm concerned about as I watch the current field that develops is everybody tries to, at best, um, do side swipe evaluation. Doesn't want to take him on directly. Afraid maybe to take him on directly. Whether that fear is political or personal, I don't know. But what I was saying to people in New Hampshire is, if you want to try to move the party forward into a future looking direction, Donald Trump is addicted to the attention the presidency gave him. And he will do anything he can to get that attention back. And the, that kind of person is not going to walk away voluntarily. So he needs to be taken on frontally and directly for the ways that he let us down as president. And there were ways, significant ways, in my view, that he did and that he has let us down in his post-presidency after having the privilege of the greatest honor that the American people can give to one of their fellow citizens. That's a failure and, to me, a disqualifying failure, which merits people going at him directly. And all I was saying to people is if I decide to get into the race, I will not shrink from that challenge and I won't try to play cute with it because playing cute with it, I think will lead to a bad result. Now, I want to also go talk about going directly at Joe Biden. I believe he is infirm. And the response to the Nashville shooting where he came down and did four minutes of stand up after telling the networks to break in 
is just the most obvious and cringeworthy evidence of that. What do you think about the president's capacity to govern right now? I've, I've been saying from the time he was elected that I thought his capacity to govern was compromised. And I think that, you know, I, I was on right after he made those comments. I was on TV and said it was one of the, the, the most pathetic performances I've ever seen by someone in public life. And it's sad. It's sad for the American people. But worse yet, it's dangerous, Hugh. It's dangerous because we don't know who is really in charge from day to day and moment to moment. And for a president to come out there after that kind of tragedy and to make jokes about being Dr. Jill Biden's husband and looking for chocolate chip ice cream. Listen, that's why the stakes are so high in the presidential race, Hugh, because the Democrats are going to renominate this guy. All evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding, they're going to renominate him for another four years. And so we cannot have this be a backward-looking 2020 replay. And I absolutely believe that that's what the stakes are in our nomination process. When you look at Joe Biden, realize that that's what we could, in fact, be in store for through 2028. Um, and how will that you know, serve the American people? How will that serve our allies around the world? How will that serve our children's futures? Um, right, last question, time. Governor. New I Hampshire think. is going to have uh, the key primary, unless Chris Sununu is in it, in which case it's devalued. South Carolina is going to have Nikki Haley and maybe Tim Scott in it. That's going to be devalued. Florida is going to have Governor DeSantis in it. That's going to be dis devalued. Does Iowa carry enough weight to decide this for the Republican Party? Because honestly, I don't know until Super Tuesday how we get a result. Look, I think that's one of the issues. And we're not going to know the answer to that question, Hugh, um, until um, we see who the field, who the entire field is. Because you're right. It's very candidate dependent on all of that. And I think that's why you see many folks like myself examining this, looking at it, because, you know, if you, you're going to make a decision to run. You want that decision to be smart one and one that helps give you a path to victory. Um, no one should be running for president for, for Pyrrhic reasons. You, you should be running for president because you see a path to winning and a, and a way to contribute uh, to the country uh, by becoming president. So we're going to have to see how all this develops. But you're right. A lot of these early, normal early primary states are devalued, and maybe it's Iowa and Nevada that wind up becoming very important, depending upon who's in the contest. Okay. Very last question, Governor. Vivek Ramaswamy and Larry Elder are both declaring for president. Neither of them have won anything. Larry's lost something. What's your advice to the RNC about candidates who have not won elections before and the debate stage? Because that's not my call to make. I, if I do a debate, it's not it's by other people's rules. But what about getting onto that stage? Look, I think we need to have a, a robust argument um, and discussion. You and I have talked about this before. Um, if we're up to me and you, we'd be having debates already. Yes. Um, and, and, and I think we need to have that discussion. And I think the criteria, whatever criteria they set up, have to be sure that they're not, uh, you know, overly exclusionary, Hugh. Um, you know, I don't think that we should have professional politicians calling the field too significantly until voters do. And so it's got to be a very careful way of looking at that and doing it. Um, and, and so I, I would be reluctant to have there be too many criteria um, that would make it very difficult for even folks who have won elections before to get on that stage. Governor Chris Christie, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Keep coming back. And I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for having me, Hugh. America, I'm Hugh Hewitt, live in Studio West, joined by United States Senator Steve Daines from the great state of Montana. Good morning, Senator. Welcome back. Well, thank you. And by the way, Montana is a great state, Hugh. I know we agree on that. Yes, we do. I fished out the, uh, the Madison once, but I think it's recovered. Uh, Steve Daines, let me talk to you about, uh, you are the chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, but before I go there, I want to know uh, about the, the reaction in the Senate GOP caucus to demands for more gun control from the President of the United States. And Lindsey Graham came out and said, we need to fund police at school. Is that the caucus's general view? Yeah, look, um, first of all, th th that sh shooting in Nashville came pretty close to home for me. I've attended Covenant Presbyterian in Nashville. 
I've uh, spent time with their senior pastor, Chad Scruggs, who lost oh, his daughter, Hallie. Uh, I w- I've been in the school where the shooting occurred. Uh, first of all, it's outrageous to me the way the President of the United States handled the situation. Where is the compassion and sympathy to these families who've been absolutely, tragically affected for the rest of their lives? So it is hard to put into words you know, what happened there in Nashville, how horrible, how evil that was. And also at the same time with evil, uh, praising those Nashville law enforcement officers, that body cam footage was chilling to see what they did. They acted decisively. They neutralized the threat. These guys are heroes, and God bless them. But regarding what's to be done, uh, gun control and calls for that is not the answer. Uh, There's consensus amongst the Republican senators. It's about securing these soft targets, these schools. And whether that means more school resource officers, retired veterans who are trained that can protect these schools, uh, they need to be hardened. And there also, of course, is a mental health crisis. This individual that that shot up that Nashville school uh, had had problems, certainly in in many ways in her life. And so, but it's, the answer is not to impose more gun control. That is not going to solve this problem. I also think the answer, you, you folks in the United States Congress spent like $7 trillion in the last four years, and for good purposes and for bad, we've got to endow school districts in this country with enough to put two armed officers at every campus, private and public. And that's not that much money. And an endowment, one-time endowment, they only get to spend the interest, is the way to go. Does anyone ever talk about that? Yeah, you know, there, there was... There was legislation passed at, uh, at several years ago. Well, it was Orrin Hatchman was in the Senate. I remember he was talking about it, that provided federal grants here to help schools harden their, you know, the target. I agree with you, Hugh. My, my daughter's a fourth grade teacher. I called her when this was unfolding, and I just as we were talking through a basic security protocol. Uh, you know, as a parent, when you drop off your child at your school, you want to make sure that you're going to pick them up, that they're going to be safe. Look at what's going on at the U.S. Capitol. We have armed security here that protects the Capitol. Uh, we need to do the same thing for our schools. Thank you, Senator. Let's turn to politics. Uh, I'm looking at the map. You are in the recruitment season. Now, every day I listen to two uh, podcasts on the Ohio State University Buckeyes, and it's always recruitment season in Ohio. And uh, John Thune is complaining we took his best quarterback out of South Dakota. Of course we will. We'll vacuum up everyone. But there are five-star recruits, and there are one-star recruits, and then there are walk-ons. And we don't need any more walk-ons in Senate races. We need five-star recruits. How's it going? Well, I've always said, Hugh, that elections are oftentimes decided on filing day, not on election day. Who gets in the races makes all the difference. We've got a map that's good. We can't fall in love with it, but we've got a good map, and it's about getting candidates who can win both a primary election and a general election. Because winning a primary is not sufficient, you've got to be able to win a general election. You've got to be able to appeal to a broader cross-section. At the end of the day, you you know, I I studied chemical engineering in college. I was pretty good at math. Politics is about addition, not subtraction and division. So we've got to be additive as we think about candidates who can appeal across the spectrum of of the center right and Republicans, but also appeal to independents. The reason we saw uh, such disappointing results in 2022 is because independent voters went, they leaned on the Democrat side when typically in a midterm election with a Democrat in the White House, we should have seen an R plus 5 to 15 advantage with independent voters. Instead, they went D plus two. That is part of the reason why you saw not only the Senate candidates fall short in 22, but the House candidates as well. Kevin McCarthy should have a 20 or 30 seat majority in the House. It turned out to be five. I think when you look at underneath the covers, it's because independent voters did not have candidates to appeal to them. And uh, they stayed on the Democrat side of the of the ledger. All right, let's talk about the swing the swing states. Uh, one of those is Montana, your home state. You've told me before you're working on it. Any updates? Yeah, so if, when you take a look at the map, there are three red states that have Democrat senators. That's Montana, it's West Virginia, it's Ohio. Each of these, each of these states, these three states, uh, are uh, 
are, are states where there's only one Democrat statewide elected official left. The Republicans are statewide in every one of those three states. Only John Tester is the, is the Democrat in Montana. Only Joe Manchin in West Virginia. Only Sheriff Brown in Ohio. They are an endangered species. And, and we think about 24, there's three red states like that. But you peek over the horizon to 26 and to 28, it's zero. There's zero red states with Democrats up in 26. There's zero red states with Democrats up in 28. We either deliver the majority in 24, or we are relegated to likely a minority for the rest of the decade. That's a chilling thought when you think about tax policy, think about judges, think about cabinet appointments, thinking about what they'll do to the Supreme Court by adding four more justices. The Democrats have their way. So in Montana, uh, what we've got at the moment is we have, uh, of course, Matt Rosenales looking at the race, I understand. Uh, also a businessman named Tim Sheehy. He's a Navy SEAL. Uh, he's looking at the race. And Attorney General Austin Knutson, who's uh, statewide elected, is also looking at the race. Uh, they would be strong candidates. It's going to be uh, an interesting time to watch how this all sorts out. But we're paying very close attention to my home state of Montana. Is Governor Justice going to run in West Virginia? He's looking strongly at, at, at uh, doing that. I've met with him. I've spoken to him. He's taken a strong look at getting the race. He's one of the most popular governors in the country. He'd be a formidable candidate. He just signed the largest tax cut in West Virginia history. He's taking a bit of a victory lap across West Virginia, as he should. By the way, West Virginia is one of the reddest states in the country. And voters are really upset with Manchin about partnering with Biden in that so-called Inflation Reduction Act. He cut a deal with the devil on that one, Hugh, and it's costing him politically. Polling data in West Virginia shows justice beats Manchin overwhelmingly. So if justice gets in the race, and I think he's leaning hard to do so, uh, that is a really good pop- pickup opportunity for the Republicans. Have you talked to Doug Ducey about Arizona? So Doug Ducey and I, by the way, both worked at Procter & Gamble uh, once upon a time. He went to Cold Stone Creamery. I went to the, so- to the software business. I've known Doug for a long time. He's a great governor. Uh, Doug is taking some time uh, after being governor. He's valuing what he wants to do next. Uh, of course, he'd be a really good recruit into the Arizona race. Uh, more to come on that. We'll see. Okay, you've cleared the field in Indiana. Jim Banks is going to be the next senator from Indiana. Next door in Ohio, there is Matt Dolan, State Senator Matt Dolan, and there's Bernie Marino, entrepreneur. They're both very strong candidates. I would prefer if they flipped a coin and one got in. I don't want anyone else in. Those two guys know what they're doing. What's the status in the Buckeye State? So uh, I think you'll need to put a third horse in that race. Uh, That's Frank LaRose, who's the Secretary of State of Ohio, statewide elected. So you've got Bernie Marino, businessman from the Cleveland area, Frank LaRose, the Secretary of State, also a Green Beret, and Matt Dolan, who's a state senator from the Cleveland area. Uh, All three of those candidates would be good candidates uh, in a primary. And by the way, and and they all could win a general election. So I look at candidates... Primary winners, general election winners, I think all three of them fit that criteria. But keep in mind, Hugh, as you know, Ohio has gotten redder because Democrats have abandoned the working class, blue collar voters that you need to win that state. Once but Sherrod time- Brown is the best at pretending not to be a Democrat of anyone I know. Well, we've got I mean, John Tester fits that bill pretty well, too, Hugh. I mean, these 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 Democrats incumbents uh in red states are very good politicians. That is why these are all going to be major, major battles here for us. You know, they say people vote with their eyes. They see Sherrod Brown, they see John Chester. You know, they, they, they look moderate, but they vote very liberal. And by the way, we've set up an account, an online account called Senate24.com. Senate24.com. That's going to escrow dollars now for Montana, West Virginia, and Ohio, that whoever comes out of those primaries as the winner, we will transfer to the candidate fund the day after the primary. Again, Senate24.com. We've got to get better at raising those small dollar donations, Hugh. It's focused on those three states, because I can tell you on November 5th of 2024, on election night, we know three questions on the final exam for that election. It's going to be Montana, West Virginia, Ohio, let's get ready now. We're doing that on the candidate recruitment side. We also have to raise the resources so they can win. We were outspent, by the way, in 22 by 3-1 to one on every Senate race that was competitive in this country. 
We, uh, we cannot allow the Democrats to have their massive cash tsunami. We've got to fight back. Next here, Pennsylvania. David McCormick would make that uh, competitive. Doug Mastriano will lose it. Are you going to play in the primary? Well, if you have somebody that has, there's not a path to win a general election, we're not going to sit, a, sit on the sidelines and be idle. There are a number of other groups out in the, in the uh, center-right universe that are not going to sit back and allow an unelectable Republican filing candidate to win a primary. We saw that in Missouri, Hugh. If you remember, uh, it was Eric Greitens against Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt was our attorney general, now a U.S. senator. Eric Greitens had, dis- had to resign in d- disgrace as governor. Uh, and there were some groups outside that made sure that Eric Schmidt won that primary in Missouri. We've got to do more of that now in races across the country. Dave McCormick is the type of candidate who can win a primary election and a general election. Uh, if Dave gets in the race, we're going to be with him. Last question. we got the less than a minute, Senator. Nevada, I love Adam Laxalt. I think he's going to be doing other things in 2024. But do you have a candidate lined up because Nevada remains on the razor's edge? Yeah, it does. Nevada, by the way, is trending Republican. Adam Laxalt lost that race by just four votes per precinct. That was a turnout issue on election because of snow in the northern part of Nevada. Uh, I spoke with Governor Lombardo last night. We are working on a couple of candidates there that can win the general election. More to come on that. Steve Daines, keep coming back. Talks have crashed in Kentucky, so prayers for everyone involved. We'll keep you posted on that. Uh, People know that I follow the House of Representatives very closely, and I like to follow it from a couple of different perspectives. David Joyce was on yesterday, my hometown congressman from Warren. Ken Calvert a couple of days ago. Juan Siscomani, though, is my representative of the freshman House GOP, because when you're new to a place, you often see things that the veterans don't see and observe uh, both traditions, good and bad, that, that people who've been there for 20 years have forgotten. He rejoins me, Congressman Siskamani. Welcome back. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Hugh. Glad to be on. Now, you're an appropriator like Joyce and um, Ken Calvert. That's a different world. What have you learned about the appropriations process since you joined House Appropriations? Well, that's a great question. That is that is a different world. And uh, when people ask me about my freshman experience, it's this is all I know in terms of being in the majority and then being blessed to be in the appropriations in my, in my first three months. So there's been a lot of, a lot of learning, a lot of uh, going back and studying and also the, the, really the questioning of the witnesses when they come in. You know, as a freshman, you want to you wanna keep up and you want to make sure that you're right there mixing it up with everyone else. And, and, I've, and I've done that. At the same time, I've, I've taken back kind of uh, taking a step back and said, okay, what, what are the basic questions here that, that we, you know, that I can ask to better understand and do my job? I keep being reminded that this job takes, you know, a little while to, to really come into, especially when you jump in as an appropriator. But I, I feel like we're off to a, to a fast start and it's been, it's been a lot of studying. And also I'll tell you this, in, in the appropriation, uh, appropriations room, I'm in three subcommittees, there is, and overall in Congress, more conversations between Democrats and Republicans that maybe the public uh, sees on TV or, or the, the news media would like to make you think. They're, no, it's where the work there. gets done. And, you know, Ken Calvert's yeah. been on it for 30 years. Dave Joyce has been on it for 10 years. You've been on it for 10 weeks. So I liked, I'd i like to know which subcommittees on approach are you on, Congressman Siskamani? Yeah, so I'm, I'm on transportation and, and housing development, the T-HUD as it's known. Labor Age, which is uh, Labor and Human uh, Health and Human Services, and also an FSGG, which is the Financial Services and General Government. Oh, so my. Those are the three that I'm on, yeah. So is David Joyce, uh, no, he's running uh, Homeland Security and EPA, but he's on a couple. Who is your chairman in those three? Uh, well, uh, Chairman Adderholt is one of them um, uh, on uh, Labor Age, and then on uh, Transportation is Tom Cole. And then on uh, financial services is uh, Congressman Womack. Okay. These are very, very experienced Congress people. What do you see right. as your job as a freshman appropriator? Because again, it's a different world. It is a subset of Congress. It is the key subset of Congress. If you know what you're doing and you're, you're involved in approps at all, what are you doing to learn how to do this particular? It's an important job, Juan, and, and that you got it is a testament to what the speaker thinks of you in the House leadership. But how do you prep for this? It's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of numbers. It's a, it's a lot of information in terms of where the funding comes from. So I ask a lot of questions. 
I had met with uh, with Womack and, and especially Tom Cole early in, in the process, even during the campaign. So when I got here, I had some relationships established, and I, I'm the kind of guy that's going to ask a lot of questions, and it's it's questions to to learn and to kind of better hang, get a better hang of it. Also, I've known I've been a freshman many times in my life. I've, I've you know been the first in my family to either go to college or different things. So I've learned that that uh, that you bring a different value to the table when when you're new, and early in in, in my career, I guess when you were new in the room, you try to uh, you know produce at the same level or in the same area, I would just say that that other senior members, and you realize that there's you know that's not your role. Your role is to really look at things from a different, fresh angle, ask questions that maybe they've uh, forgotten. What's interesting is that many times that I'm questioning some of the witnesses uh, or secretaries that come in. When it's my turn, which is at the end of the line, right? So everybody asks their questions, and I'm the last one. I'm the freshman. Uh, uh, taking it back to some of the basics, it, it makes everyone kind of like recalibrate a little bit on, on what the big issue here is that, we, that we're trying to tackle. My colleagues, because they're so experienced, they're able to get really into the weeds and, and, and deep into the questions. Uh, I, I'm, I'll get there at some point, but right now I'm, I'm asking questions that kind of frame the conversation. On the health subcommittee, do you get CDC under that? Yes. Yeah. I, right. Yes, I believe we do. Yeah. L- let me let me I don't want to misquote myself on that one. Let, let me make sure. Yeah. I think if you get HHS, you get CDC. Yeah, yeah, you, and get, if you... you get that whole department. We. Yeah. So so that that is one that it's that is a, the, the largest one that in my in my portfolio. And that's why I'm, I'm understanding all the aspects of it. And different agencies get funding from different subcommittees as well. So it's not just, you know, one of them. That's why I hesitated a little bit there. But but it's um, that that is that is a, a, a beast of, of a of a committee. So sure. when you're an appropriator, lobbyists line. Now I am not now, nor have I ever been a lobbyist. But I know what lobbyists do. They line up outside of the appropriator's office and they try and get in. Are you? Are, what is your reaction to the number of people with their hand out in D.C.? <laughs> there's there's quite a bit of that. There is, and uh, like I said, our calendar could be full by the minute, and it is right now, and. When I talk to my team and I'm and I say, "Hey, gosh, this is a minute-to-minute kind of full schedule," and, and they tell me, "Well, you should see the, the the amount of meetings that we couldn't fit in," and that's that's mainly because of of the amount of people trying to come in and see us. Now, I prioritize, of course, seeing my constituents that come in from from out of town. So it's a it's a balance of of doing this. Now, uh, all these people are professionals and and they know where we're, where we are, what committee. So we see the ones that are relevant to the areas where we can impact. But this is this is this was the uh, community funding project season to submit them as well, which every member gets to do. So this has been a busy season in in our own right of uh, submitting our our priorities. And and but but the work is going to of course pick up even more and more as we approach the summer. Okay, so we're on in Tucson right now, and they obviously I always ask like David Joyce yesterday, who represents my hometown of Warren, what's in it for Warren? So I like that. What's in it for Tucson? What is your priority for Tucson? Well, our priorities are, are several. We, we have a, a lot of good projects that were submitted from our, from our community. We're going to be releasing the list here very soon. But they include transportation, uh, infrastructure, projects around water. Uh, these are all the, the, the local impact that we can have. Uh, we have also, I submitted a couple of bills uh, two weeks ago around veterans. And uh, that that will have uh, some appropriated funds as well. That's of course for the entire country, but in my my district, I have over seventy thousand veterans living in my district. So this is this is important legislation that we need to be investing in our veterans. So you've got a Democratic governor, Governor Hobbs, and I've never thought she was going to win the spelling bee. I am curious if she has figured out yet that this freshman from Tucson holds the key to the kingdom for what she needs in so many places. Have you been in touch with Governor Hobbs? Has she reached out to you? We haven't connected. Uh, our, our team did reach out, and we, we weren't successful in connecting. And uh, listen, I, I've, I've been there in the governor's office when you're starting out, and things are hectic as an understatement. I mean, I, I was setting up my own office here. Uh, I do look forward to working with everyone in Arizona, and we, we, we have to. And I tell you this, when I when I – was appointed to appropriations. I called every member of the delegation, the, the Republicans and the Democrats, everyone uh, that that is, serves in Arizona. And I said, because I'm the only one from Arizona serving in appropriations. 
So I said, listen, we, we have to work together. I would need to understand the priorities for the state. Of course, the priorities for CD6 will always be my, my top focus, but we, we need to make sure that Arizona's in a good position. We have roads like I-10 uh, over the, the, the my, my community that listens to this will understand the widening of the I-10 and the importance of that. It's a main uh, freeway between Tucson and Phoenix that's uh, incredibly important for trade and also for security. So I call it the artery of, of Arizona and the main artery. And that's that that's one of the projects that we need to be uh, continue to to prioritize. So that that's kind of what I'm pushing up here. In terms uh, of the local last market. question, Juan Siscomani. You've been there now four months or three months. What's the most surprising thing that you've discovered being a freshman in the People's House? Well, that's a great question. Quite quite a number of things, but I would say again, one of the things is you, when you get here, you're right off the campaign trail, and you're. You're, when you're campaigning, you're competing to win. And to win, you need to differentiate yourself from the other side. And, and that sometimes involves going back and forth and then quite a bit of arguing and fighting on that. So you get here ready to rock and roll and push your priorities. And, and, then, and then you realize that, that many people on the other side of the aisle you know, see things the, the way that, that we do as well. A lot of the bills that we've voted on have had bipartisan support. This means that they're good ideas. We've had Democrats voting with us. And then in committee, it's even um, more of a, a relationship-based uh, approach here. Now, our philosophical differences are clear, and we are differentiating ourselves there. We're fighting for our values. But there's more cooperation than what people see. That is good news. Congressman Juan Siscomani, our designated representative from the freshman class of 2023. Keep coming back. He landed on appropriations that is good for everyone in Arizona of course, you got to go walk, work with David Joyce about what's good for Warren and with Ken Calvert about what's good for the national defense. But just keep learning. Keep coming back. Juan Siscomani, thank you, my friend. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back, America. A little inside baseball there for you. I'm Hugh Hewitt.